I am so glad to be back. Um, actually, I was so nervous last night, thinking about being here this morning, got up, I was like, couldn't sleep and stuff. I'm like, you're preaching my first sermon after three and a half months. This is probably the longest time I went without preaching, so uh, I hope I don't, I don't embarrass myself. No, just kidding. But uh, to God be all the glory, amen? As I was getting up this morning, I was thinking, or actually it was last night, I, I got, went to bed, went to sleep for about an hour, got up like I usually do, so I was up for a couple hours last night, and the Lord reminded me of something that I wanted to share with you before I even start, amen? And it, it was, it's something super, super profound, so you, if you have paper and pen, please uh, get, this, get ready, because you need to write this down, because the Father told me to tell you this. That he sent his son to come to this earth to die on your behalf. Amen. And his son rose from the dead, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you right now. Yes, he is. Amen. I mean, Jesus is praying for you. Isn't that cool? I think that's, I don't know. We think, just put, try to wrap your mind around that for a moment. The Son of God, sitting at the right hand of Father God, interceding, praying, crying out to God on your behalf. And it says every day. Now that's really cool. And then he said, like I said a little earlier, earlier, he sent his spirit that he promised that he would send on the day of Pentecost. And it says young men will dream dreams and old men will see visions. All right, so how many young people we have in this place? Probably everybody. So dream some dreams for God, amen? Those dreams are from the Lord, asking for the interpretation. He said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. So I, yeah, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, is what he told us, told his disciples. And he's telling you today that you're not comfortless. I sent the Holy Spirit to help you run the race that you're about to run, or you continue to run, Amen. And we have to remember it's the Holy Spirit the one that guides us and leads us. And I think the problem with the church today, and I won't get into too much preaching at this moment, because I have to, my wife's going to come to you. But the weakness I see in our church and churches across the world is that we won't allow the Holy Spirit to move in our individual lives and in the life of our church. So like Rick was here a little bit ago and he says he's playing this music, right? And you're playing it, so I gotta do these songs. I picked out six songs, I wanna play these songs. They have to go in order because he's prayed about those, but then when the Spirit of God moved, he was willing to say, oh, let me just slow down a little bit. Let me change the tempo here. Let's, let's sing this song, did you notice that? And this atmosphere changed, didn't it? Because why? Because now we, we're doing what the Spirit of God wants us to do, amen? It's a difference in your life and the life of the church, amen? And I will share with you a little bit later why I said all that, is that okay? Are you, were you with me? Yeah. Because I have a lot to say. I, I wanna tell you one thing, when you leave here today, when you leave here today, I want you to know one thing, that we love you and God loves you. Amen, if you, don't, if you write it down now, if you leave right now, I just want you to know that Pastor Bob and Pastor Tina love you. That's right. We love you. I appreciate these guys that have put up with me being gone for three months. Dion in the back, wave Dion. And Raji and Richard's downstairs with the children today. And Angel, I just want to thank you guys right now for just keeping everything together. Amen? And I know it wasn't easy, so thank you. And uh, I'm going to share for you. <laughs> so. Um, Bob asked me to share just a little bit what it meant um, to me with him being on sabbatical. And first and foremost, he needed it. We needed it. And the two thoughts that have come to my mind is um, when uh, Brother Held, Ron Held was here and he spoke and he shared a message about the difference between being a son or being a servant. And, and I listened, we listened to that message and, and I thought to myself, have I fallen into the servant mentality? We had read a book that um, talked about being a, 
Just instead of doing, just be. And that confused me for quite some time. What does that mean to be, just be? Be his daughter instead of the servant that is constantly serving and doing something. And I think what happened is that I fell into, every time I picked up the word, I was looking for something to share. Instead of hearing from my father and sharing out of the abundance and the overflow of my heart of what he was doing. And so we needed that time. But during that time now, when I go into the Word, when I go into a devotional, God is speaking. My Father, my Daddy, is speaking directly to me. I'm not looking for the next thing that I'm supposed to preach on or the next thing that I'm supposed to share with the ladies. I am now just spending time with Him, which I knew that we're supposed to. We all know that, right? But I fell into that trap. And he has healed a lot of things inside and made things all new. So thank you for giving us that opportunity. So when now it's a joy. God wants us to have joy. That's part of who the Holy Spirit is for us. And so thank you for the opportunity to rest and get my eyes focused where they were supposed to be on him. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I am going to, I have three points to my sermon. I've been listening to all the sermons that were given. I thought to myself, wow, did all those good sermons you guys heard over the last one, two months? And I thought, wow, I'm going to have to step it up a little bit. But anyway, I want to talk to you today about three things. The true shepherd, Jesus, and then myself as your shepherd, or what a shepherd should be, and then myself as your shepherd. Um, if you will, turn to your Bibles to John chapter 10, as Jesus explains this story about being a shepherd. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you so much for, again, a privilege to stand in this pulpit in front of these people for your glory. And Father, all that is said and all that is done from this moment forward, God, I pray it brings glory to you, Lord. Father, hide me behind the very cross of Jesus. Cleanse me by your blood and change me that I may be your spokesman this morning. And I give you praise for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you go to chapter 10, I just want you to put your finger there. But let me explain to you that this story is wrapped in the chapter 10 is wrapped in between 9 and 11. And there's a reason for that. I want to share a little bit with you why before I get into chapter 10. Chapter, 11, uh, chapter 9, we see Jesus spitting on the ground, making mud, and putting this mud into a blind person's eyes. And I think that's cool, because I like to try that someday. Spit on the ground, make some mud, throw it in some blind guy's eye, and go wash, and, and then they see. Wouldn't that be cool? I just still think it can happen. Jesus did it, right? So anyway, he, he, he uh, tells this man to go and wash. He washes his eyes, and all of a sudden, he's able to see. The religious people got really upset because now, isn't this guy that used to beg in the courts, but now he's seeing something's wrong. And now he's giving all the glory to this Jesus guy that we don't like and is really messing up our religious uh, activities at the temple. But here this guy, nobody can deny it, is seeing. They're so upset, they even call his mom and dad in. And they asked his mom and dad to come in. They come in, and could you imagine, in the Sanhedrin, right? All these religious guys with all their religious garb on, asking him, and, was your son born blind? Yes, they said. You read it for yourself. How is it that he now sees? Well, you can ask him because he's over, he's of age now. You can ask him, he can speak for himself. So we know it from 
Jewish history that he's probably around 40 years old already. He was a man. He could speak for himself. What he said happened probably happened. Why are you asking us? So they asked him again, what happened? How can you now see? And he said, I already told you once, you didn't believe me, I'm not going to tell you again. It's the Jesus, he prayed for me, put some mud in my eyes, told me to wash, I washed, and now I see. Amazing story, isn't it? Yes. I said, it's amazing. God caused the blind to see. It really messed up the religious people because they could explain away everything else, but this blind guy that everybody knew that begged in the temple courts for years and years is now seeing. Hallelujah. How many of you are blind and need to see today? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> so let's look at chapter 10. And it says this, verse 1. It says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the gate, the, the, enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs into it by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters the gate is, is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman op opens the gate of his, for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out all his own, on his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. And Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. How many of you guys read the Bible sometimes and you just don't understand what it says? Be honest. I mean, come on. You go through the, even go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is telling a parable and I'm thinking, come on, I know there's a good meaning to this. What does it mean? What does it mean? Well, this particular incident, Jesus tells him what it means. Let's look at the next part, verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate. Jesus is the gate for the sh uh, for the sheep, and all who and ever come before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will not will be saved, but will uh, he will come in and out, go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly, some Bible say, or to its fullest. Amen. I am the good shepherd, verse 11. The good shepherd lays on his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the sheep shepherd who goes, who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the um, the flock is scattered, but let's go back up to the verse 7. It says, he is the good shepherd. So what is he telling these guys? He's telling the, the, the people that there's only one way to go to heaven. Isn't that right? There's only one way to be a sheep, if you will, or a follower of Jesus. It's only going through Jesus. Not through all, now think what he's teaching. He's teaching this to the Jewish people at this time. So all the laws and all of the, law, the, the laws that the, the, uh, the religious people had put, put into place for them to follow so they could be righteous. He's saying that's, all that is not the right way, but I am the only right way. Could you imagine that? They got a little upset, didn't they? You don't have to follow the, these laws. You don't have to follow their rules. Just follow me. And if you listen to my voice and you follow me and you can become part of my sheep, Hand or my full, then you will have eternal life. Not only will you have eternal life, you'll have life now and you'll have it to its fullest. How many want full life? Amen. Amen. Now, I kind of think about it. What does that mean to have full life? Eternal. Jesus said here, you can have life to its fullest, or some translations say you can have abundant life. Now in America, automatically go to things, right? If I had abundant life, I'd have maybe a new car. A nice, your car's pretty nice out in the parking lot. I saw that's pretty cool. Um, I have a bigger house, of course, because the house I have is not adequate, right? Because I'm not content with what I have, right? I always want more money so I can do more things. We try to justify that very religiously. Man, if I had more money, I could give more to the church, which you probably wouldn't do anyway because you'd probably spend it on yourself, right? Come on, I'm just trying to be real, be honest, right? More stuff, more things, you know, whatever. And so I have to examine that. We kind of look at this 
word of God, not in the context of what we do in America. Right? This word was given so all people, all nations, every race, right, can understand this and understand. So what if you were in a country where you lived in a tent, that was what you did, or you were a, a farmer or whatever, and you didn't have much. So how would you have abundant life? What would abundant life look like in your life right now? If you had nothing material, no, 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 no material things, what would it look like? Could you still have abundant life? You have to, because the word of God does not lie. So what is the abundant life that you and I can have? It is what I believe. Okay? Let me say so what I believe. Peace from God. Amen. A peace that Man, I don't care how messed up things are going in your life. I don't know how scared you are. I don't care what's going on financially. I don't care what's going on in your marriage. But there's got to be a peace there if I'm a follower of Jesus. Amen? This is, this is good medicine, all right? There should be a peace and a happiness in you because I have a relationship with the Father. I like what Tina said. Is, I have been gone for three months. It's been, it's been hard. And I've drove back pot at church a few times. And I even went in my office, you know, when I wasn't supposed to, but I did. And, you know, <laughs> uh, looked at me. Uh, but just to know God has everything in control. And I can have peace. And that he is there for me all the time. And he's there for you all the time. And have joy. And you know what's cool? Do you know God answers your prayers? Yes. Do you know if you would just pray and take a moment in a day or in the morning or in the evening and, and bow your knee to God and pray to Him, He would answer your prayer? Isn't that cool? I mean, I don't know how, how you feel about that, but I think that gives me great joy and great peace to know that the Creator of this world, the God of the universe, the God who sent His Son down to, to die for me and take my sins away when I asked Him, the same God that sent His Spirit to guide me and lead me through this life is now the one that's going to allow me to talk to Him. I don't know how about you, but I'm pretty humbled at that. And now because the curtain was ripped in the temple, I can not only be in the outer court, I can now be in the inner court, but now I can be in the Holy of Holies and I can go right into the very presence of God. And make my petitions, my requests, and cry out to God. Man, that is so amazing. He wants to do that for you and me. Amen? So Jesus is the shepherd, right? Now let's look at, look at verse 11. He's talking about those that are not the shepherds now. The ones that are going to lead you astray. He said, they're not the shepherds. Don't follow them. Don't listen to their voice. Know that God has put a shepherd in place for you to listen to. So for, don't listen to me, but listen to Jesus. Amen? Well, pastor, there's like so many churches and so many congregations and so, hey, we'll get together by the end of time, okay? Right? There's only one Lord and one Savior. There's only one way to God through Jesus Christ. The church will get it together eventually, and I believe that's when the end of time will come, okay? So let's not be confused by man's religion. Let's just stick to the Word of God and listen to what it says here. There are other people, there are other voices out there that are going to guide you and try to lead you in the, the roads that are not going to be following Jesus. How do you know when something's true? Does it confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? If there's a religion out there or an organization out there that doesn't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, it's a false religion. Write it down. Make sure you understand that. Amen? If they don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and not sitting at the right hand of Father, that's a false religion. So whatever you want to do from here on out, just those are your two plumb lines of truth. Amen? Then you know there's a false religion there. Amen? Maybe even those that don't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, you can take those religions and set them aside. There's some false religions out there. There's false things out there. There's false people that will try to steal from you the truth of God's word. They're used by the enemy to, to, to cause confusion in your life. If you have confusion about who you are in Christ, that's of the enemy. Amen? And I stand here today with these gentlemen and say, we're going to pray for you. And we're going to call your names out before God. And we're going to pray that the enemy doesn't cause confusion or division. And when that happens, and when division happens, or when your confusion comes, know that it's not of God. And I always find out, I always find this about, I to tell myself too, because, you know, we were, we've been doing a lot of stuff for eight years in Madison. Is our, going on our eight, well, February, we'll be starting our ninth year. 
a lot of things, a lot of tasks, a lot of doing stuff. And we did, we kind of got away from just studying the Word of God and getting ready for the next Sunday service or the next Wednesday night prayer meeting or, or whatever thing we're going to do. And we forgot, we got away. And I don't know how it happened. I think we just woke up one day and realized we weren't where we were supposed to be. Is that okay? How many has been there? You know, you're walking with God, everything's cool. You know, you're hearing the Spirit of God, you're praying for people, you're seeing, praying for the sick, you're leading people to Jesus, and all of a sudden one day you wake up and you haven't done that in a while. And you go, how did I do that? How did I get there? I didn't pray for my children like I was supposed to. I just took it for granted because I'm a pastor. Pray for your little, little girl daughter. What's her name? Abigail. Abigail. Can we pray for her right now? Let's pray for Abigail. I, you know, my daughter has some issues like that too, and it's not that same thing, but you know, going to school for the first time, new place, and needing to make friends, and then, you know, if you have some issues, it just it's, it makes life difficult. Can we pray for Abigail? Would you do that? Father, how this lift up your hands just towards Pastor Rip right here. Hallelujah. Father, we just pray for Abigail right now. Father, we just pray for this 14-year-old young girl. Father, scared to even get up in the morning and go to school. Father, I take fear off of her right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray you place that fear with your spirit, Lord God, and give her peace. Father, give her father and her mother wisdom as they encourage her to take the next step, Father God. And Father, we thank you for Abigail, Lord. Strengthen her today. Bring good, godly, Christian friends around her, Lord God, that will Lift her up also. Give her favor with her, her peers at her school, Lord God. Give her favor with her teachers also, Father. And Lord, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Pray for your, if you're married, pray for your spouses. Please don't ever not pray for your wife or your husband. If you're not married, pray for, pray for me, I guess. You know, just don't, don't be afraid to pray for others. And God will do miracles. And I was, I mean, can I just jump ahead to the end of my sermon for a second? Do you know what we need in the church today? We need miracles. Yes. Yes. Amen. We need people saved and healed. Yes. yes. Amen. We need, the, we, need the, we need the power of God in our midst all the time. And you need it in your life. And I know how to activate the power of God. Do you want to know the secret to activating the power of God in your life? Come on. How many want to know the power of the secret? There is really, really no secret. Just do it. Yeah, just, you know, when you're on the marketplace, I love this, and you guys have been with me for a while, you know where I'm, exactly where I'm going because this is my heart. Listen, be Jesus in the marketplace. And when Jesus was going through the marketplace, what happened? He had compassion on people that were struggling, right? They had a physical need or, or blind or crippled or, or whatever. And it, compassion came over Jesus. He looked at people as lost sheep, and he gathered them in, and he said, well, here, let me pray for you. And stuff happened. And I'm telling you, I don't want to be a dead church. I don't just want to do this Sunday morning, amen? I like Sunday morning. Don't get me wrong. I get to speak, so I'm, I'm happy with that. I love this. But you know, it's not about Sunday morning. It's really about eternity. And it's what we do in the marketplace, the people you work with, the people you're around every day. You know, I, I challenged the church when I first came here. I said, does your friends know you're a Christian and the people you work with? Like if I went to your work and said, hey, this is, this is a deacon in my church. Would they say, really? <laughs> <laughs> or would they go, I know, because he's preaching to you all the time. You know, you should be, your neighbor should know you love Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. Why? Because the miracles and the power of God will be activated in you. Your faith will increase when you begin to share what God's done in your heart. That's why, like what Tina said, out of, I, now out of the abundance I can teach, not just by because I'm studying this as a textbook and trying to teach it. No, now out of the abundance of a relationship with God, it flows out and it just, it's got to come out. It's got to come out. Like rivers of living water will flow out of you, right? And then when that river, river rivers fall out, it's going to touch people. Amen. Touch your family. Touch your relationships. Amen. And touch the people around you. Hallelujah. How did I get way off of there? But that's a, that's good stuff right there, ain't it? Come on. I got three points. I'm just going to get to it, all right? But I'm just telling you, this relationship with God is so important. Where is your relationship with Jesus? 
Man, I haven't talked to him in such a long time. I don't know my relationship with Jesus. That's a good place to start right there. That's a good place to start. Right, where, where, right there. Jesus is a good shepherd. Amen. He protects the sheep. Amen. Look, let's turn over to Psalms 23. Look at the good shepherd. Everybody knows this one, right? Man, I know. If you're a Christian, you know Psalms 23. If you're not a Christian, most people know Psalms 23. Isn't that amazing? It's kind of cool. Look at, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and switch over there to Psalms 23. Or your iPod or your iPhone or wherever you have your text. It doesn't really matter. The 23rd Psalm. And it says, it starts off right this. The Lord is my shepherd. It's kind of hard to, you know, you have to, the Lord has to be your shepherd for the rest of it to, 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 to apply to you, okay? If the Lord is not your shepherd, then he, he doesn't apply to you. It says, I shall not want. So if Jesus is your shepherd, the Lord, this is referring to Jesus, is your shepherd, then it says here, I, you, don't, you won't want anything. You should be content, Americans, okay? I love Pastor Kim. He's a Korean pastor. He'll be preaching. He's studying at the University of Madison. He's studying forgiveness. So he's got two, two more years to finish up his doctorate. And it's so, you know, he's just an amazing young man. I love him. And he's going to be preaching. And I forgot where I was going with that. This is happening a lot. But uh, anyway, he's, he'll be preaching on, on Sunday. But uh, he, his, he um, oh, man, that's terrible. Don't, don't record this, okay? Um, <laughs> Yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I don't know where I'll go with that. But remember, Pastor Kim was preaching on the 6th. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Okay, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. Look, he's going to take you where you need to eat, right? He's going to give you what you need to drink or sustain life. Amen? Drink of the word. Drink of the, uh, of the spirit of God. Amen? And it says... Um, he restores my soul. So what happens? If you put Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you shall not want. You should be and not of need. Be content with what you have. And then he'll take you to where you need to eat. He'll give you the water that you need to drink. Amen. And it will restore your soul. How many souls need to be restored this morning? Mm -hmm. Ah, Lord, I restore. I'm just so confused. I'm so upset about my situation. I just... Don't know what's gonna happen. And she's like, hey, let me just take you over here to this pasture over here. Let me let me give you something to eat. Let me give you something to drink. You know, when Jesus was saw the blind and the, the people that were uh, the crowd that gathered right before they, they uh, had the miracle with the bread, he looked at them with compassion. So they're like lost sheep without a shepherd. He always refers to this shepherding thing, isn't it? Isn't it amazing why he calls Jesus a shepherd? Why does Jesus a shepherd? The shepherd worked in the field at, on the day of his birth, and they were out there tending the sheep, protecting the sheep, looking after them, and the angels of the Lord came. And they said, hey, in Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, there's going to be a, the, the Son of God is going to be born. I want you to go over there and see this wonderful miracle. And he came to the shepherd. I thought, why did he come to the shepherds? And then why in Psalm in Isaiah 62 talks about the, the watchman looking over the city? And why is he used that example of shepherding? I think because shepherds are like, well, in most most um, occupations, shepherding was like the lowest one. Almost next to the guy washing the feet when he came to the people's house. Out in the field at night. But you know, the sheep knew their shepherd. And they would lay their life down to save one of those little sheep. Amen? That's what Jesus did for us. He laid his life down for you and me. Yes. He says here, if you would, if you understand this, if you will allow me to be your shepherd, as we said, if you are my shepherd, you shall not want. I'll help you, lead you by, behind still water, I'll bring you to a place to eat. He guides me in the path of righteousness. How many need help being righteous? Come on. If you're not being bombarded every day by the enemy trying to get you off track, listen, we have to be kept on this right track. 
and it's the whole it's the it's it's Jesus who guides us by his spirit amen for his namesake not so you can be righteous not so you can wear a title look what I've done but that Jesus can be glorified in your life. Isn't that probably some of the problems we have today is that we want to take all the credit for who we are and our righteousness. But it should all go to Jesus. True Christians now. I'm talking about two true Christians now. And then Jesus be glorified in your life. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley, valley of the shadow of death. Man, I haven't been there. But I could imagine. You know. What would it be like if you were like at death's door? Have you ever been sick where you've been so sick with fever? I mean, you just didn't know what's going to happen. I remember, was it Christopher or, or, yeah, Christopher was so sick one time, our son. Christopher was so sick one time. And we took him, we were, came home from church. It was a play practice, wasn't it? It was a Christmas play practice. Christopher was so sick. And he was only two or three years old. And he was running with fever, and we're trying to get some medicine in him, and we're holding him and praying and seeking God. Lord, touch our son. And there's Christopher just calling out the name Jesus at three and four years old. That's what we need to be like, right? We're in trouble. Just call him Jesus. I don't know what to do, Jesus. There's something about that name. There's a song, right, Rick? There's just something about the name of Jesus. And when you're in trouble or you walk through that valley and it just seems like there's no hope, it's a hopeless uh, uh, situation, you just call on the name of Jesus and man, he can take you right through that thing. Amen. I like this part where it says, I don't know, have you probably heard this before, right? It says, I walk through the valley to shadow death. You know, don't have a picnic there. Don't have a pity party. Just go through it and Jesus is going to take you right on the other side. And guess what? There's going to be a smile. There's going to be victory. There's going to be peace. God's going to take you. Jesus is going to take you right through. I will fear no evil for you are with me. My, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I like, do you ever study this out? The rod, everybody knows what the shepherd's staff is, right? But do you, anybody know what the rod is? Has everybody studied that out? If you study that out, the rod is just like a piece of wood had a, a, a heavy end on one side. That's what they would, they would throw at the wolves or they would come attack the animals. A heavy stick goes for offensive weapon, if you will. And so it protects you. And let, let me tell you, well, I'll wait a little bit, but listen, I have uh, fought off the enemy here many, many times because I don't want nothing but God's pure word and God's pure love to come through this church, amen? We're not going to have false doctrine coming through this place, amen? And we'll protect you. These guys will protect you, amen? Because we want the truth to be spoken here. And that's hard because you can go to every, Madison, Wisconsin, you can go to every church and hear every type of doctrine and get your ears tickled and, and just go, amen? And I'm not saying we're the only one either, by far. But there's a lot of stuff out there that just aren't truth. We're going to preach the truth, amen, right here out of this word. Praise the Lord. Come on, say amen or something. Yeah, yeah I know that's tough. Pastor Bob came back and beat us up right away. But no, I just don't want you to, I want you to know there's hope only in Jesus. Not in me, but in Jesus, amen. Not in the, not in the system, but Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, but I love this last part. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint me from my head with oil. My cup will overflow. Surely goodness and love or mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I came to Madison, Wisconsin, God gave me two things. He said, this house will be a house of prayer for all nations. Amen. So what does that mean? All nations can meet in this building, which we're working on really hard, and we can pray together. Amen? And we'll pray. We'll, we'll start every service with prayer, and we'll end every service with prayer. We talked, Tina and I talked about this. At the end of the sermon today, we'll get a chance for you to respond to the service, sermon. But even if you don't want, to, don't, have, don't want to respond to the sermon, that's okay, but if you have a need today, no matter what it is, we want to pray for you. Amen? We don't want to leave, we don't want you to leave here saying, oh man, I should have Pastor pray for me or have Tina pray for me or, or have one of the guys pray for me. Amen? No, don't, don't leave here without getting your getting prayed for. Amen? Because we believe God can change your life through prayer. Amen? I might not be able to do something for you physically, but I know I can pray for you. And I know the God of heaven can hear our, hear our prayers and he can change your situation. Amen? And I believe in that. I think the church needs to get back to praying and caring for one another. And that's what I want to say to you today, that we will do that. We will care for you. I believe the second thing the Lord told me, well, I don't believe it. I know what he told me. 
says, he said this, he said, this house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And what's the next one, Joe? You know, that we will reach the nations through this church. And I remember just, we had a, there's eight of us then, right? And I remember sharing that with the group then. There was eight people in the church. I said, there's, I said, and we're going to reach the nations through, through this church. And you know, we haven't had the congregation grow to hundreds in this building, but we've seen people come through this building, give their life to Jesus, been disciple, and now we're back to the countries. That's why I love being in Madison, Wisconsin. We see so many people. I think of Pradeep and, and uh, Fen Yen and those that have given their life to Jesus here at this church and now they're gone back to their countries. It's, it's a miracle. It's, a, it's wonderful. And then I, I love Facebook because now I can stay connected with them, right? <laughs> and make sure they're connected to the church in their country and, uh, and, and serve the Lord. Also, um, God has given me two other verses that I want to share with you today. And the first one is in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. If you want to turn there, I'll show you. Uh, this was early in our, our, our time here. God has reconfirmed through our, our sabbatical that he hasn't changed the vision for Capital City Church. Amen? Mm -hmm. So I didn't go on the, I didn't go as, it, it, people are saying, well, pastor, what is God speaking to you? You know what? It was really cool because the first couple days when we were on our sabbatical, we actually went on to a, a pastor's retreat uh, through Broom Tree Ministries. They allowed us to go up there for free. It was a one week, Tina and I went, and we just went up there in the first three days, and God knew my heart. I didn't want to leave the church. I felt like I, I needed to be here, you know, take care of things, and, and the Lord gave me rest, and I, I slept the first three days. I slept like God, I think I ate and slept. That's all I did. And, but through that sleeping time, God gave me dreams and, and visions of this church and this ministry in Madison, Wisconsin. And, and through the end, I told Tina, right? It was like third day, Wednesday. I said, you know what? Nothing's changed. It's the same vision. It's the same purpose. We just got to execute now. Amen? And so we realized what we have to do. Love each other. Disciple each other. And win the loss. Share our faith. Amen. We want to encourage you to do that. We're going to do that through uh, some training. But here, Acts chapter 2, and I think we just jumped on to verse 42. It says, um, this, is, this is the beginning of the church. Remember, the Holy Spirit was outpoured. The uh, Spirit of God came. Thousands of people got say, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then this, this is they're talking about the fellowship of the believers. Verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship of the breaking of bread and to prayer. Can I say it again? They, they fellowship together, they broke bread together, right? They ate together. Uh, we love eating here, amen? I mean, Christians love eating. That's just part of fellowship, right? You invite somebody over. The coolest thing is you have these internationals and you have these college students that are away from home. You want to be cool just to invite them to your house for a dinner and make them feel welcome, amen? And I think that's a really good part. We have fellowship together. That's why we have our small groups now. And then we have prayer. And I tell my small group leaders, I said, you start with prayer and you end with prayer. Right? You start and you end with prayer. Why? Because you want to acknowledge that you're starting, obviously, that's prayer. And give God glory and give God place in your meeting. Right? But then you want to end in prayer because through that meeting, even if it was just a fun time, a barbecue or maybe just do, going out someplace, you, you want to meet the needs of the people. And that's our leaders going to do that. Amen. So we, we fellowship together, breaking bread, and we have prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miracle signs were done by the apostles. Amen. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods, and they gave to everyone that they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who be saved. So, well, Pastor, that's not for us today. I'd like the beginning of the church. It's different. I don't think it's any different. But we dedicate ourselves to serving one another which is a big thing because that means you have to put somebody else before yourself, right? So we serve one another and we rejoice and be happy for what God has done, amen? And God added your numbers. But I like this miracle sign thing. I just kind of, God's been putting something in my spirit about that, you know? God wants to do signs and wonders in your life. Right? Because if, if you go back to... Um, uh, John chapter uh, 10 and then chapter 11, then that's what then Lazarus was, 
was raised from the dead right after that. So it really blew those religious people out of the water. I mean, he's talking about he's the only way. In chapter 10, he's the shepherd. He's a great shepherd. He loves, he's going to take care, he's going to protect you and me. Amen? And then he has another miracle. This next miracle, is, I mean, he thought opening blind eyes was cool. Think about raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, I, I only know of one time when somebody was raised from the dead. I was in, I was in Pensacola, Florida, met a missionary, and he was sharing with me a story. He was in, in Siberia where he would go through on a circuit where he'd go preach at different homes throughout Siberia, right? And when he got to this one village, they had this dead body in the village, in the, in the, in the home. And he said to him, if you can raise this person to the dead, it will believe in your God. This is what they said. And I'm thinking, and he told me, he, he, at that moment, he said, okay, God, you're going to have to do it. And guess what? God raised that person from the dead right in the midst of that place. Can that happen today? Yes. Come on. We don't see it. Middle of Siberia? Okay, great. I probably would never go to Siberia, but hey, God, those people are believers today because that man was dead and now he's alive. So God is doing miracles. Just, I mean, there, there's so many things that can happen if we just believe that God can do what he said he would do. Yes. So I believe we need these miracles today. Amen. We need to continue to pray for one another. Jackie came in. We prayed for her last week. She said, oh my, I got strength. It's still sore. And they're not going to be serving now, right? So they, they're, they're, their uh, strength has come to her knees. So, okay, well, we pray for her again this week, right? God finished. He laid her knee. So she don't have uh, bone on bone, right? I mean, so that cartilage will reform in her knee. So every time you think of Jackie this week, would you pray for her? And say, God, would you create into her her knee and strengthen her knee? I remember God healing a, young, a man here. So, I mean, God is doing those things if we simply believe that he can do it. We have to get our faith to a point like, yes, God, I believe your word. See, I'm not of the, of the sect that would say, well, this part of the Bible is not for the day, and this part of the Bible is not for this, you know, and that's not there. I just can't, I simply believe what I read, and I believe that it was preserved so we can have faith to do the things that we see in the Word. And our faith will be increased. So, not Capital City Church or Pastor Bob be glorified, but that Jesus be glorified. Amen? Amen. And also, uh, we want to continue to meet together in our small group. So I would I say this to you as a church. This is the only thing we want you to do. We want you to come to Sunday morning and worship with us and hear the word of God. Amen? And we want you to get attached to a small group. Right now we have two groups. Uh, Rajiv and Hapsabah are hosting the uh, younger married couples, I guess if you're below 40, that group. And then we have, we're not in that group. And, um, <laughs> and then um, uh, Rajiv, I mean um, Angel and, and uh, Richard will be hosting an international group. And Tina and I will probably be starting a group also, starting we'll probably meeting on Sunday evenings. Probably we'll just meet here so it'll be more convenient for everybody that doesn't fit those two categories. Amen? And so we're excited about that because we believe in that we have relationships built. And when you build relationships with people within the church, it becomes your family. And we love family. Amen. We love the, we have, we host people in our home all the time. We just love that, making people feel welcome and just, you know, have a meal together and just, we just love that. And, and uh, it's just part of what God, uh, God, God wants us to do. And so our part of that will be um, a training other leaders, other, other of you that have committed to be part of our church family. We want to train you up and to do, have more groups. And man, you said, well, there's not only enough here to have two or three groups right now, but you know what? If everybody here had their own group, we would grow because what we'd hope would happen is you invite people that wouldn't come to church on Sunday to your home, right? We have people that say, well, I'm not, never gonna go back to church because those people offended me and it could have happened 20 years ago, but they'll come to your house and have a Bible study or meet you at a coffee shop and, and share and you talk to Jesus with them. It's amazing, but people, they want to know about God, but some person in the church offended them, and they won't go back to a church, amen? But we still believe that God loves them, we want to reach them, all right? And we feel that that's important, so we, that's one of the reasons we started our small groups, is we want those that are outside the church 
come and, and be attached or get reattached to the church. Amen? Let's turn to 1 Peter 5, 2, and I'm going to kind of close with this. I always say kind of because... So when as I was uh, yeah if you want to please can you get the why do you use that right here okay thank you praise the Lord you know part of our experience on Sunday morning is worship too we love to worship God Amen I like your uh, slide the little stairs up to heaven kind of thing you know our focus when you uh, when we worship is to, to focus on God. Amen. Jesus came. The Holy Spirit helps leads us to worship the Father. Amen. We just love that. We love worshiping and praising God. And Tina is going to share a song in a few minutes on uh, God you reign. I've been singing this all week, so it's like, hey, yeah, let's send a service with that. Today. God, you reign over our individual lives. But God, you reign over Capital City Church. And God, you reign over Madison, Wisconsin. And I don't care what the world says Madison is. I believe it's a blessed city. And I believe many people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, strengthen their relationship with God because of the ministries that go on in the city. But this is what the Lord shared with me. And I want to share this to you. It's kind of like he said, this is you, and you need to obey this. And that's why I want to read this to you. So I, I want you to know as your shepherd, I'm getting my direction from God. And I study and I read other things and other pastors and other ministries and what they're doing. And I think I'm, you know, that's great. And, you know, philosophies and stuff. But, you know, something different. When I get on my knees and I, I'm standing in the sanctuary this weekend. And God reassures that this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You can't, I can't, I can't tell you. I don't have words to express how God puts in you the love for not only you as uh, the people of this church and the city. It's, it's just so great. And it's, it kind of kind of charges me, you know? Hey, read this. I'm like, okay, I surrender. I can't do this on my own, and, and uh, I refuse to do it on my own any longer. But let me read this to you as a mandate or as a charge to me from God. It says, to you, to the elders among you, I, I appeal at... As a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, and the one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing. As God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Verse 5. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to humble. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled be, and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same type of suffering in verse 10. And the God of all peace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be all the power and forever and ever. Amen. God is saying the same thing to you and me today. Stand firm. Stand on Him. He is the chief shepherd. 
He loves you and He cares about you. And if you don't remember anything today that I said, and I know it's kind of out of bounds, but listen, I love you. We love you. And we are here. We are your shepherds. And we'll be here till God comes back, till the great shepherd comes back. Amen? And we'll fight the good fight. And when the enemy comes in, we'll, we'll stand against that together. And we'll see the glory of God come and fill this house with your lives. Amen? And fill this city. I know Madison, everybody says, well, Madison's a tough area. It's like Berkeley of the Midwest, whatever. I know it's just one person that needs, I want to see one more person come to know Jesus. That's all I want. Just one more person come to know Jesus. And then when that one comes, and I'm going to want one more. Amen? Just one after another. And that should be your heart's desire. Share your faith. Don't be afraid. Pray for people. Amen? Be encouraged. God loves you, and we love you. Amen? We're going to sing. Tina's going to lead us. Would you stand? I think um, they got the words right. Where she was there.